microphones there. It's so dangerous, so easy to destroy. <laughs> Start, let me just update you on the program. So, uh, as you may have noticed, there's been a shift. So, after the coffee break, we will have the hands on tutorial by David Altman on reinforcement learning. It will be a review of the basic theory and some hands on exercise. The second tutorial on deep reinforcement learning has been moved to Thursday afternoon. Okay, so that's going to be the last uh, event of the day for Thursday. Now let's, uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Jan Peters, uh, uh, who will deliver three lectures on robotics learning. As you may know, it's one of the fields of applied machine learning that has been experiencing uh, a very rapid, uh, impressive developments in the last few months, I would say, <laughs> even so. Uh, then uh, let me just leave the floor. Okay, okay. all righty. First, sorry for all the confusion this morning. Just I couldn't be at the same time at the airport and here, I guess. Um, so I'll be talking today about robot learning. And obviously, this is all your dream. What you see here is basically one of the reasons why any of us got into computer science, right? Hollywood movies. But basically, in there, we had all the dreams which a future robot should be capable of doing. It should be able to do the chores we don't like, um, like these trash cans. It should be able to take care of our dog sitting. And most importantly, it should be our friend. Um, now, obviously, you directly recognize how hard this is going to be, right? I mean, think quickly about all the uncertainty in this environment and the well, safety concerns for that little kid. And finally, well, um, well, the programming complexity of this particular task. So big question is, for us in robotics, can we create humanoid robots like that? And I'll start a little bit historically, since basically it's been now nearly a century since the idea of the, of the, uh, since the word robot actually came up. Yep. And you know, since the first movies showed a humanoid robot, and well, since the 1960s, we already have industrial robot arms, like Engelberger's Unimate. Finally, since the 70s, everybody is convinced, thanks to Star Wars. But it really took up to the 1990s that we had the first full humanoid robots, which actually would look, well, which would look sufficiently interesting for more complex tasks <laughs> outside of, of, no, uh, outside of uh, factory environments. Let's have a little look at what's out there in the zoo before we get into the whole learning thing so that I can persuade you that this is a good task to follow. So what you see here is obviously a German robot. It's upright, it's very squared, and yes, this was built by the University of Karlsruhe, or these days called KIT. Now, this year is actually not a humanoid. It's a centaur. So we are thinking about a horse with a human torso already. Then you have here a little, two things which look exactly like astronauts. But that's actually, was a, this, is a very, was, this used to be one of the nicest robots you could actually buy for just 150K dollars. Um, and it's not an astro both of them are not astronauts. But the Asimo, the one built by Honda and well officially terminated, inofficially still being rebranded into a new project, well that's been on the news for uh, quite a while. You've probably seen it play soccer with Obama. Then there's way more in Japan. The Kawada Industries ones are built pretty much like the Asimo, but they move a little bit nicer. They they are, well, the, uh, can you imagine how much they cost? The country of France rented two of them. Any idea how much they would be per year? Oh, sorry, I thought you were. Okay, well, about half a million per year. So, pretty expensive. Um, this is not a robot, by the way. Finally, well, here you see two historically famous examples, the robot Jack from ETL, 
and the robot Koch at MIT. One should say Koch actually never really worked. It obviously required two PhD students with soldering irons in order for it to, in order to execute even a single experiment. Then we are getting actually to the level now where people start to reproduce themselves. So this year is one of these two is Professor Ishiguro, who managed to well recreate himself in such a way that he can teleoperate his humanoid and have this humanoid give his lectures for him. Now I can't tell which of the two is Professor Ishiguro, but I can also not tell who's the scarier looking dude <laughs> of the two. Finally here, a famous germ robot that's just in a DLR, um, one of the first really professionally built half torsos. And here's probably the most frequently built humanoid um, from a research lab, the ICAP, actually made not so far from here, here in Italy and Genoa. Then we personally, we, I like the, well, I don't know why that is. I like the Sarkos robots a lot which have been really quite some of the most pioneering robots. They're hydraulic and they're very, very nice first generation and well, I had the pleasure of working with them in the past. Most impressive is maybe what you see coming out of the company Boston Dynamics. Now Boston Dynamics brings you all of these little creatures like here you see the spot. By the way, this will soon be available commercially. They cost about 100K. So from a robotics perspective, very cheap for a quadruped. Um, and they're amazingly impressive, but you've got to be very careful. The company Boston Dynamics is of course in the business of turning military money into nice videos. And that's a very good business model, and I think it's, it's good for the world too if the US fights fewer wars and spends more on videos. Um, but generically, it, well, this is the one which you can hopefully buy soon, and generically this means we are basically seeing an emerging technology. Let's skip through this, these more boring ones. Um, and here, yeah, this one I liked it a lot too, where you basically see, well, robot on wheels, wheels as wheels on the bottom of legs. And well, balancing as it is again a task classical engineers can do quite well. And it's, well, you see that this is actually doing pretty amazing thing, acrobatics. Again, let's fast forward a bit through this. And then here you see Wildcat. Now this is a quadruped which actually gets, I think, close to, uh, I think it was close to 92 kilometers per hour. No, sorry, here it's 32. Damn it, where did I get the 92? Okay, 32 kilometers per hour. So it's pretty rapid speeds. You could be, well, you should be a little bit scared of that already. If you're around it, you will nevertheless notice it's really, really noisy. And it gazzles actually gallons, so that's four liters per mile, and not, it doesn't do miles per gallon, so um, it won't get very far with a regular tank like of water. It's pretty robust already what they do. And I mean, mainly they do trotting gates. So um, as these are the most stably built, stable ones that you can build among the gates. And to some extent, it always looks like, well, two men in tights, right? Holding a block together. <laughs> so and I lost my mouse again. Ah, oh, there it is. So now let's look at the one part which has actually only been very recently um, fully released. Um, so this is all pretty much from this, I think from this year from Boston Dynamics. Um, you see things like somersaulting. And let's skip forward again a bit. I like uh, the lifting part is maybe not that in. How much time do I have here? I think this is actually close to the very end. I think. Oh, where's the parkour part? 
Okay, in that case, I have to quickly add one, to show you one more video. I thought this was in there. Um, that is embarrassing. But that's a video which is, just shows you at what state we currently are in robotics. which I wanted to still show you. Now you notice already this jogging-like gait, and now this here is the most impressive we have so far seen in terms of humanoid robot behavior, and in terms of build, robots being built up to now. Now that obviously, well, I think we, we all safely agree, this qualifies as amazing, right? We've now seen several hundreds of different robots at different levels being designed. And nevertheless, we're far away from this dream, right? This dream of having the iRobot at our home. And when you look at it, well, you really start to, to recognize that for all of these Boston Dynamics demos, for example, we've had sm really smart engineers. In fact, Boston Dynamics hired some of the smartest professors and managed to, them, managed to, to tell them to give up their jobs uh, and join Boston Dynamics so that they would get the, um, well, that they would engineer these robots, engineer the according to the trajectories, and really get all of this to work. And this is a far cry from the humanoid we actually want to have, the one which can do many different tasks at our home, in our hospitals, in our rehabilitation institutions, you name it. Even the cobot working in industry together with you is a far cry, it requires substantially more programming being, um, which is in robotics much, much more work because you in the end need to formalize it, you need to try it on a real system, trying it in simulation is never enough and um, we really when you look at this you would think despite all of these amazing robots we're actually kind of stuck. So what should we do? Well I propose for, I propose many people, other people have done that before me is that learning is the only way to incorporate it, um, autonomous robots, bring them out of, the fa out of the research labs, away from the factory floors, as into the, everybody's life. And I think by now it is kind of arrived with the classical robotics community. In fact, even the old, the outgoing big shots seem to be recognizing this. So Samar Khatib at some point said to me, I've always said that the time for robot learning would come later. But analytical robotics has barely moved for 10 years. The time for learning is now. And well, John Hollerbach at some point put it the way, robot learning is the single most important problem in robotics. And I think this is really the case. So yes, sir. So, but that implies that uh, all these nice robots from Boston Dynamics don't have any learning. They don't have any learning, nothing. That's a, usually it's a pre-programmed um, trajectory which they're following and um, they have a stabilizing controller around it. Um, in some cases, is this the, well, in some cases, this pre-programmed uh, trajectory is well, a little bit deformed. They need a little bit of replanning, but there's absolutely no learning. And this, even when the parkour case, is, um, this was very, very well done, well prepared. So the, the state of the art, a state of art in robotics is very much at smart engineer sits down, models the task up to 150 50 micrometers, then comes up with a really good controller and um, well, corresponding trajectory. Boston Dynamics is already a bit better because these are really robustly built controllers, but nevertheless, they're really centered around this one task of executing a gate, um, which is again just one type of trajectory generation. You're welcome. Yes, sir. To be sure, if you talk about a robot, it's not the guy that has a controller. No, in, of, these, 
of these robots, nearly everything has not been teleoperated. I mean, I think Ishiguro teleoperates as a robot, but so the the crazy Japanese professor. Um, everybody, everything else here is um, well. I'm not sure whether I should call it autonomous, but it's um, program controlled. Yes, program controlled. I would call it. And in fact, we've started bringing learning into a variety of areas. It's not like just because you've seen all these amazing successes is now and these amazing robots, it's not like there hasn't been learning. In fact, we've been learning basic motor skills, we've been learning in object manipulation. There is a lot of learning happening at the, re at the rehabilitation level as well as at the prosthetics level. At airplane control, well, um, people have uh, well, learned pretty heavy helicopter acrobatics and, well, Things like SLAM has been a classic, so localization and mapping is a classic learning application. So is robot locomotion. And we all want to bring it, of course, to this guy. So let's have a look at what has been done so far in learning. So this is a task from my lab about eight or nine years ago. We took the robot by the hand and we showed it this ball on a string ball bouncing scenario. And what you see here is, well, what, human, what um, well, people who study human motor control call kinesthetic teaching. And the robot actually managed to do this out of the box. This was actually just one afternoon of an experiment, but we nevertheless got to write a paper about it. How does this compare to classical programming? Well, I had a really smart student who sat down and we tried for six months before we did the the imitation learning experiment. He sat down for six months, and for six months, he tried to, to program this behavior, and the robot always hit the ball exactly two or three times, and then it would just miss it, and it would never recover. Despite then it, it in a simulator, it always looked perfect. And the, reason, the reason behind this is, of course, that there are sufficiently many, well, hard to model nonlinearities when you have a slightly elastic but not fully elastic string, when you have a paddle which has rubber on it, and these do not always behave the same way, it's very, very hard to get a good behavior you're running if you're just doing this with a smart human within a simulator, um, and it doesn't transfer well to the robot. It has four cameras uh, seeing the ball, and it has proprioceptive sensing being through the joint angles through which it gets joint angles and joint velocities. Um, they are classical um, industrial cl cameras, so you would not use an RGB camera here because you, you want to have this relatively fast. In RGB, if a, ball, if a table tennis ball would move through the picture, you would probably not even see it. And um, since you need to, very, need to open the lens only very, very quickly and close it again, and you also want to have a higher sampling rate. So we use industrial VGA cameras, um, which have about 200 hertz here. Now, a task which actually preceded us, but is actually somewhat easier, is this one here. What you see here is a humanoid robot juggling. Now, why is juggling easy? Juggling actually has it that you only have to hit the right rhythm. And if you're always at the right location and you really have enough to throw off uh, the ball off, it's something you can reproduce, again, by imitation learning, amazingly well with an open loop trajectory. But of course, you have to learn this trajectory first, and you have to be able to do the accelerations which you require in order to execute it. So it's actually not, it's not trivial at all, but it's, um, you don't need the ball observations. In fact, for humans, you can show that humans juggle best if, you, if they have learned not to look at the, the, the ball when you put a screen in front of them, but they only see the balls when they come by at the top so that they can lock um, to the synchronicity of their juggling behavior. If they train this, this, then they get the juggling thing right after a while. Then you can learn things where you do start by imitation, but subsequently go for reinforcement learning. So here, again, we take the robot by the hand and we show the robot uh, ball and the cup behavior. And, uh, well, after imitation, it fails. 
And now it gets a little reward based on, well, proximity of ball and cap. And, well, there's already 15 trials, 25 trials, gets more reward. Still not quite there. After 40-something trials, it can actually occasionally get the ball into the cup. But what you see here, it just hit the rim. Becomes even better in a moment. Or not. Actually not. But it actually becomes perfect after about 90 trials. And you can have it executed for days and days and days, and it will perfectly get the ball into the cup. And this is compared to humans. Well, first of all, humans, you need to use chocolate as rewards. And humans cheat. But um, we, on the humans, we tried. So we, um, one of my students created a human set. It's not a data set, a human set out of uh, family members. And um, the six to eight year olds did not manage to learn it at all. The eight to 10 year olds, uh, sorry, the 10 to 12 year olds take about 30 trials, 30 to 35 trials, so slightly better than the algorithm. And the grown-ups take three, four trials. So it seems to be only me who took three months to learn it. So let's continue. You can now also take, well, learn more complex things with actually more different behaviors. So you can, for example, learn something like taking a robot by the arm and um, showing it at, um, well, diff showing it different forehands. By imitation learning, it could extract from this that there are 25 basic behaviors. And these basic behaviors, well, all give you different responses to uh, even the same or to different incoming balls. And you can subsequently, well, use these behaviors to generalize. And by a reweighted combination, for example, of these different behaviors. And already imitation learning gives you a pretty good answer, since you get already something close to between 60 and 70% success rate against a ball gun. Oops, that is not too. Today I'm cursed. Don't get any clo don't get too close to me, I think. Maybe dangerous. So then you notice, well, imitation learning is not enough. You'll always find regions where the robot does not successfully return. So you aim the ball gun at these, you do some reinforcement learning, robot self-improves. And the robot, well, after some trials, it'll actually get for that particular region to a success rate which is substantially higher. In this case, it moved from 0% to about 80%. All over against the ball gun, you can actually get it that far that it can do 97% of all, uh, return 97% of all balls per, uh, correctly. Finally, you see the robot playing against its teacher here. And I should highlight Katarina learned table tennis for her PhD, as she's very proud to say. She's a computer scientist. And as an advisor, I always say, well, she taught the robot to become about as good as she is. Then you can, um, well, again, by a mixture, by in this case, a mixture of imitation and reinforcement learning, you can actually teach um, air hockey to a robot. And, well, these, um, this humanoid managed to actually learn this task, despite that actually only an arm was involved. Do and then they find also innovate, sorry. Hmm? Do they also innovate when you train them for reinforcement mm -hmm. learning? Do, also, do they also try to re innovate and do something new to make sure so close? This actually happens occasionally. So we've had this in grasping in particular, that we would teach it a couple of, of grasps, and then we would see totally different grasp emerging. Like this year is a grasp no human would ever teach a robot. But most robot hands are very awkward hands. And so many robots very quickly re learn, remove the thumb. It can only break things. And then holds um, the hand, this, holds the object in this case. 
But what also happens quite frequently is that when we break a finger in a hand, you will suddenly see um, new grasps emerging. You will actually not understand why until much later when you try to repair the hand, uh, actually when you first realize that there is something broken and then repair the hand. And then you will recognize that, well, um, some joint was broken, and for that reason, the learning agent becomes creative. And that's, that's what we have both observed. Obviously, we are searching in a very, very high dimensional state action space. But in other words, it's not that likely that we find completely new paths in it, uh, since that's obviously the holy grail of uh, reinforcement learning, to find the right paths, new paths through the state action space um, for a very, very high dimensional system. We always talk about continuous systems here, so not about, I mean, many people talk about high dimensional discrete systems, but um, sorry, when you discretize a continuous system, that's high dimensional, and you really don't want to do that. Sorry. Yes, sir. How much of this learning can be done in a computer and then transferred to a robot? Okay, this is a good question. So this is the, the sim to real question. Right? I mean, how much can Did I just break? No, I hope not. Okay, notes. So, okay, it doesn't seem to be broken, I hope. Um, if so, I'm sorry. <laughs> Scary. Um, so the, um, there's a big, big general question about simulation and robotics. Because we all know how to build a graphically beautiful simulator, and we all know they're wrong. I mean, there's some, some parts you can simulate quite well. For example, the, one of the reasons why you see in Boston Dynamics usually it, things are in flight phases, and they only have instantaneous contact. That is a very good reason. That is, during flight phase, a rigid body system can be simulated very well. However, when a, when a system makes contact, then it gets really difficult. That's, for example, the reason why Boston Dynamics stuff usually has point feet, so that you can only make it a, give it a very short contact, which you can simulate badly, but at least much better. So it's very rare that you can train something in simulation and directly transfer it. In most cases, we actually need learning on the real robot. There's even something much worse to it. And that's a question we have only started to understand very, very recently. And that is that um, when, you are sim when you're using a simulator in order to optimize behavior, you're prone to something which is called the optimization bias which basically means when your simulator has a single error, and this error allows you to get more energy, more reward, more you name it, it'll directly jump to it. And this is a very dangerous one. I did not know about, knew about it when I started my lab. When I started my lab and I tried to well, learn a relatively simple task, it was like just a figure eight task, which was, getting, it was supposed to get a lot of reward, it looked beautiful in simulator, and I turned it on the robot, and the first thing it did on the robot was bang. So what had happened? Well, the simulator, which I had actually learned from data in this case, had a slight error on, which is only in a slight, small region due to regularization, the sign of friction was somewhat wrong, with the result that it thought, hey, I can actually get an energy pump here. And so it totally went, burst into this, this optimization bias and uh, went for getting into this region and oscillating in it real fast so that it would get all the energy it would later need. And instead of, well, staying in this region, obviously did this year, and, well, broke its wrist. And my first job when I just became a group leader was to go to my boss and say, hey, you bought me this nice little robot. And I'm sorry, but you actually need to pay for the first repair in my first week, too. So, but that's robotics to you. You actually have to deal with real systems. And these break, and there are sometimes there is a fairly dirty component there, too. More questions? All righty. Then let me show you one more video before I'm through with the pep talk. Um, this year, I got a, well, went all over the net about a couple of years back, but it's really, really beautiful. This little robot has actually learned to traverse ter uh, terrain. 
And for that, you need to put it in perspective. This robot is, well, it's a little brother to the big, it's also made by Boston Dynamics, but it's really the little brother to all of the other ones because it's, it's really stiff and it really has too few degrees of freedom. It doesn't have hydraulic actuation, it's all of the Boston Dynamics things, but has gearboxes in there, so it doesn't have the speeds and force generation. But in order, and in the first, people have been having competitions with this for several years, actually for more than a decade, and the first competitions on that were that looked like robot sits down, robot rolls over. Robot has a leg broken. And reality behind it is it's actually really hard to move when you have just three degrees of freedom in all of your legs. And well, what you see here is, well, what a robot can do when it has learned good footholds, when it has learned in special movements for extreme terrain. And even with the robots which are not so beautifully built as the hydraulic machines you've seen before, you can actually get amazingly far as, well, these videos show you. Recovery behaviors. I'll let it play out for the fun of it unless, let me quickly check. Yeah, I think that's fine to let it play out. This is how the normal robotics control versus a learned controller would look like. I think this is a good point to stop. So, what I want to take you on to in the next three days is a very fast journey through robot learning. And if I'm going too fast, do slow me down. If you think it's all boring and you want, to, want me to speed up, let me know as well. Um, I will start today still by the topic of model learning. And if we have enough time, we may even get into the first part of reinforcement learning for robotics. Subsequently, I, on, well, on Wednesday, I'll, uh, on Tuesday, I will continue with the reinforcement learning. And on Wednesday, I will, I'm planning to go into imitation learning which is, well, these three types of learning are really the core topics of robot learning. As robot, as robot learners, we are an emerging field. We are not yet as far as, like, let's say, machine learning on data sets. We're not even that far as reinforcement learning on simulators, simply because we are obviously held back by hardware. But I think the explosion is coming now. And um, since up to now, when you look at Classical robotics, robots had usually exactly one task. And what we see now, thanks to learning, is that it becomes more than one, and that the number of tasks will now grow from now on pretty much rapidly. And you could really underline this by the statement of the CEO of KUKA who said, well, up to now, robots had to do one task a million of times. The robots in the foreseeable future will have to do millions of tasks just several times, just already for production. And now imagine what this means for the whole rest of things. Now, three core technologies we do need for this. One is learning models, then using these models for reinforcement learning in the sense of optimal control on learned models. Then on, well, what you can do with the value function methods. And then in, we'll look into a policy search. And then we look into two ways of imitation learning. The first way of imitation learning, which we call behavioral cloning, is basically trying to mimic or copy the teacher. In the second way, called inverse reinforcement learning, we try to recover the reward function of the teacher or some for, surrogate of it and from it, try to obtain behavior. Questions? Yes? How, quick, how easy is it to transfer the learning? Let's say it's learned ping pong. Mm -hmm. You want to aid, transfer to aid hockey. Is it like learning from scratch again, or like since it's not basic movements? Like so the, these days, um, you could well, use the same learning framework, so the same algorithmic framework around it but you would actually have a hard time um, gaining anything out of air hockey. 
we at some point tried to go from um, ping pong to badminton, which to us seemed to be a, two relatively similar sports. It turned out that we were totally wrong there. So I mean, the framework with the framework, we could actually learn both. But what we hadn't realized is that in badminton, you needed to do a much stronger hit um, in order to get the right acceleration of the of this feather ball of the uh, how is it called shuttlecock. Okay, then you you would need in order to accelerate a ping pong ball, which deforms and actually can store energy much better. So, in a way, you need to when it comes to robotics, you need to be prepared to be, always be surprised. One other example: we try to throw hammers to the ceiling. It turned out to be really, really difficult. Since what we humans do out of our wrist, just with these wonderful actuators called muscles, which are kind of catapult-like. We can store energy and we can release it at, at will and we can release it at really high accelerations while, well, human, while robots at the moment have electrical motors or hydraulic actuation, which just has a much slower build-up of force and cannot cope with the um, similar, well, cannot yield similar behavior. And does that work much better if you have these soft robots? So if you have less weight, less inertia, all this works better because you can accelerate better. That's one thing you can do. Another thing which you can do is obviously to build actuators which are variable stiffness, where you could now have, two sp have several springs and well, kind of tighten these springs and then release one of them and the, you suddenly get a really, really big response. So in a way, different actuation, um, a mixture of different actuation and less weight will solve a lot of problems. I mean, just like when you think about it, the wrist of the arms you see in, the, in which these buried arms is about two kilograms. If I would cut off your arm, your arm would be two kilograms. Just to give you a feeling of um, most of our actuation actually sits in our base. And that has, well, very practical reasons because it's actually the same insight which Boston Dynamics uses. Since Boston Dynamics, they make the body of the robot very, very heavy so that they can control the legs of these robots with classical methods. Um, while the body obviously, well, is not then nonlinear, but they keep it in a, nearly in the same regime, so it doesn't matter that much. So hardware, unfortunately, matters in robotics, much more than we, well, are willing to think. So now let me switch to the second slide set. So, and let's start with learning a model. So in, in, a, in a way, maybe to give you a bit of a big picture, in the, what you, why model learning and, and well, what is actually the, the, what are the core differences between the, the different lectures? In my, generically, when you're interacting with a robot, what you can get is different data sets. One data set is, of course, really, really useful. It's the one where we have a, get a state of the robot, like joint angles, velocities, we somehow have actions which, in the worst case, are the actual torques we send to the motors or the muscle activations we would send to muscles. In slightly better cases, this could also be, well, for example, the acceleration, which we could command the system to do, but that requires, of course, that we have a low-level control policy. And then what we get, well, is basically the next state. And the first thing which we are generically lacking, of course, is a good model. Well, what does a good model do? It predicts, whoops, it predicts the next state as a function of state in action. 
Now, this model will have many purposes. And one purpose is, of course, to learn a policy. Again, a basic policy could be Now, policy, e-learning, can come with a, well, two kinds of data sets. One kind of data set looks like this one before, where we have, well, just state, action, next state, in which case we can do exactly one thing, and that is that we can do imitation learning. Now, if we augment our data set by one more variable, by an immediate cost or reward, if you're a more positive thinking person, now let's actually make this in orange, then by doing the orange one, well, you could also get it, would also get a policy but you would get it by reinforcement learning. And as I've told you already before, my goal for today is that we get into model learning. Now, model for us in robotics has actually more connotations than for, um, well, than for people who work in classical re well, reinforcement learning on simulators. Because we can actually do with the model already some things, well, which are useful for us, which, um, like for example, Boston Dynamics will sit down and manually actually look up table telephone book work wise, they very frequently do this, compute an inverse model of their body. Now, for us, that is one instance of model learning. Um, in fact, the classical Raybar toppers, this, um, this was kind of a pogo stick, one-legged version of the Boston Dynamics robots, which were made by Mark Raybar before he founded Boston Dynamics when he was still a professor at MIT, was, in was completely built on using a lookup table, look table representation of, the, of all the computations you needed for as an inverse model of the body. So clearly, models can be super useful well, for by themselves. As you will see, in a, as, well, you always need, well, by themselves, already knowing where your finger is, given your joint angles, is a super important question. Then you can use inverse models for control directly. And, well, finally, as simulator. Now again, it may happen what happened to me if you do use them as simulators. You may break your robot. But nevertheless, a learned simulator is frequently much better than a simulator which you can program by hand. Because there's just so much in the real world which we don't understand even at a physical level. We always claim physics is solved, which is only true for a freely floating object which doesn't make contact with the environment and has no friction. Immediately when you go in, no actuator dynamics. Immediately when you go away from that, you're losing physics as a helper and friend. Now, it doesn't mean that physics doesn't remain useful, but it is no longer the solution to, to everything. Yes? So, for imitation learning, don't you have to also have a model for the human this, motion dynamics in order to make this the, That's a very good point. This depends. So, if you... Now, this is, this is a really interesting question. Maybe I should put this in a slide, in, in a tree. So you can have the data set without the reward. 
So let's make this the first data set. And um, you could have the data set with the reward. So I'll just put a not reward here. Um, when you have the one without the reward, you have two roads. One road is, well, you directly use supervised learning. In which case, and directly get a policy. In the other case, you need to plug in a model, or you need to learn a model from this data set first, then use this model in order to, well, solve then a reinforcement learning problem which comes along. So you need to reconstruct the reward, and only from that you actually get a policy. And this here is, of course, a loop. So this is the kind of learning you mean, but you don't always, for imitation, need to understand what the other person is doing. Just take, the, take how a kid frequently learns things. Like directly after you're born, and I just repeated this experience with my twins a year ago, many kids are capable of directly imitating doing like an hour or two later the first behavior. And it's, it, it is really like you, you make a funny face and they'll make a funny face. Yes, and it doesn't happen for every kid, so don't be disappointed if it doesn't happen for the one you're trying on. It only worked for one of my twins. But it's a very classical psychologist experiment. And in this case, I don't think the kid has any model about the parent which it uses. In fact, it will just plainly copy. Well, if you, if you have a model, well, this is the only way of how you can get a surrogate, like a reward-like surrogate, out of um, your data without having a reward. I should also highlight, when you have a reward, there's actually three strings which you have. In the first string, you would first obtain a model, then obtain what we call a value function, and then from this obtain a policy. In the second, this year, we call optimal control uh, with learned models. And this will be, I'll just call this RL1 here, since this will be the first part of our lecture. Um, this year is, by the way, EL imitation learning 2, since this is inverse reinforcement learning. No, maybe I should. Inverse RL. I'll give it proper names. By the way, you've got to tell me if you can't read things. Um, since I have terrible handwriting, I know this. Um, so this year we call behavioral cloning. Um, this step down here is called optimal control. And when you first get a model, then a value function, then a policy. If you follow the road of directly getting a value function without actually trying to get a model and then getting a policy from it, well, that's what we usually call well, value function methods. And finally, there's a whole area of things where you directly try to get the policy, which we call policy search. In a way, these really differ in what space the core approximation happens. Since in optimal control, the core approximation is to the model. In value function methods, the core step is the approximation to the value function. In policy search, well, you're actually searching in policy space. Again, this will be, well, I guess it will be tomorrow over this. I got to hurry already, or don't I? I have until 6, 4, 15, right? 4.15. Okay. You, am I, you guys happy with me so far? Okay. Alrighty. So let's start now on this, well, particular step, which is a key ingredient to two of our approaches, the part of getting the model. And it's basically the, the key application of supervised learning and robot learning. 
And the key thing for us is, well, obviously, when you're learning a model in robotics, you're trying to model something which is always true. This is quite different from learning a policy or value function, which obviously changes in the moment where you want to change your objective or your behavior. But the model should be something like physics, which ideally doesn't change unless you move to light speed. And we can observe a lot of information and make much more efficient use of that if we learn a model. Now, learning a model is basically nearly, well, it's nearly always, is, well, can be easier than classical physical modeling. Try to do what you have learned in high school about mechanics and um, instead of doing it for the small linear example of the car which you learned in high school, try to just do it to a three degrees of freedom arm. And you will see it's a medium scale nightmare to just compute things for three degrees of freedom. You, we automatically do this obviously, we have some nice uh, Mathematica scripts which automatically symbolically compute good uh, physics for us. But for six degrees of freedom arm, you already get a telephone book of equations if you really want to print them out, out all as equations in their core form. So it's, qu it's quite hard to get a good physical model, even at the computational level. And well, use, well, using learned models for a policy can be a super data efficient thing for us to do. So part of this lecture is going to be, well, we're going to start with an example. And then I will show you different kinds of models and learning architectures which we use in robotics. And then we're going to do three different case studies. Uh, oops, what happened to my third case study? That's interesting. OK, two case studies. It's actually kind of sad, um, which, well, should demonstrate the power of robot learning to you. And let's start with an example. Now, this here is a Mars rover. You have all heard about it, since by now it has actually landed on Mars and was a successful mission, even stayed alive for much longer. What you probably haven't learned about is that there was a heavy amount of learning involved in order to make this happen. Since this is a pretty difficult problem, just think about this. This is a teleoperated system, so you may not call it a robot initially, and you're totally right, um, until you recognize that this is, well, 1.5 astronomical units, which is eight, um, dot, well, 8 times 1.5, so 12 minutes away from us. So you actually have to wait for 12 minutes to see what happened after you joysticked a command. And well, even when you want to put and you want to keep all, as obviously NASA wants to keep all intelligence on Earth, since um, well, sending a human being along is kind of costly um, in comparison to robotics. Well, for that reason, they have a guy with a joystick somewhere in Houston. And this robot, though, has to act for eight minutes. And if you always have to give it 10 centimeters, eight minutes wait, 10 centimeters, eight minutes wait, that's not a very good mode. So it needs to be autonomous for, well, tw sorry, 12 minutes altogether. And this brings us to the two key problems. Well, it can get stuck, can hit a door, go into a rock, and um, well, we have to cope with the delays of the human action, so we have to really fill in for the human action so that the behavior remains good. And well, for that, you really need good models. And what people did immediately was that they created a sand dune, which, um, well, actually, no, sorry, this is the real sand dune on Mars. This is the purgatory dune. But um, you directly see how difficult it is to operate there because you, well, may get stuck in this uh, sand right away. So in this case, we want to, well, learn a model. And, well, how would you do this? Well, you, you would have to try to learn, uh, well, in this case, we were still in the classical world before deep learning. And you would try to work, obviously, on stereo imagery. And you would have an IMU, which, um, who of you doesn't know what an IMU is? Okay, that case I gotta explain this to you. So IMU basically measures the accelerations. By having it, you also get one acceleration obviously for, get for, for free, and that is the acceleration of gravity, so the gravity vector. We humans 
have it, and it's quite crucial to all of our motor control. Um, it's the so-called vestibular organ, which sits in the middle of your ear. If you would numb it, you would actually not be able to walk properly ever again. So quite crucial, and we actually need this for, well, relative orientation, relation to, well, the gravity vector, for example, or also, well, for training data. Now, from stereo imagery, we can get a lot of different features. We can actually get some 2D map features. We can get some appearance features. But, and from I, the IMU, we can get the direction of the gravity vector to, at the moment. What we really want to have, though, are things like predicted slip. Will, the, will I just slide if I go into this direction, or can I safely continue into this direction, for example? Or will I get stuck? Uh, and um, that obviously is a core problem. And in there, we have two sub-variables which make a well, big difference there. And for that, you could assume, well, a graph now a, uh, graphical model that well slip um, that at, well the terrain type it, um, depends on both the appearance and the geometry, and that slip again appear um, depends on the terrain type, um, on the appearance features and the geometry features. And, well, seemingly gra and gravity was probably mangled into this. So what do we actually have as inputs here? Well only these two. What do you have as outputs? What we want to have? Well, we would like to have, for example, this lip. And here are our terrain type, oops, gravity. So now let's see how this is technically, um, well, how this technically looks like. Well, when you look through the eyes of the robot, now still on Earth, you would see things like here, this path, um, or the, the sandy terrain with some brush on the sides. This would be different camera pictures. In addition, you would have the IMU. And for the IMU, you need to first look at this one here. Since IMUs are not around since yesterday, IMUs are actually quite important for fighter plane stabilization for rockets in the past. Is that you could, this is the kind of IMU they put into the intercontinental rockets. It's in order to control how a rocket would, well, make it from the Soviet Union to the USA or from the USA to the Soviet Union. And you could be accurate up to two kilometers as when you went once around the world with it, just by accumulating the IMU, which is a pretty, oh, just by, well, thanks to the accumulation of IMU signals. So how does such an IMU work? It usually is several of these, these gimbals nested in each other which um, then take up, uh, well, take up accelerations. Today, they're tiny. They look like this year. What do we get next? Well, we obviously have to train um, terrain slope as a, predict as a predictive model in here, and um, then learn terrain type, which on Mars can be, some of them can be super useful, like sand and soil. Some are totally useless, like grass or asphalt or wood chip, but, um, and here you see that it does a fair, would fair, do a fairly good job. So, what would we all need? In the end, the simplification would be that we, uh, well, we the simplification would be that we do this by clustering in nearest neighbor for the terrain types, and then you treat the prediction of slip as a regression problem. And well, this was evaluated quite successfully here you see basically how well, how well it does in terms of slip prediction. Sometimes there are outliers where the robot would have to adapt the behavior yeah, in order to have a fail safe. But all over, and you see that, well, if you know the terrain type, it would be perfect there. So this is really a terrain type uh, mistake. And um, well, yeah, if the terrain type is known, predictions are spot on. Now this system actually made it in, I think, a slightly modified form um, as far as I understand it to Mars, which is pretty cool. Well, and it, bring, it shows you that you have enormous power in robotics already by just doing things which, from a machine learning point of view, seem to be, well, ultra simple um, in comparison to the kind of models we very frequently create in machine learning. 
But obviously, figuring them out and putting in the real-world robotics understanding, which you sometimes need in robotics, um, well, there is a lot of mileage in there too. So now I want to take you into the next part of the journey. And that is that I want to make clear to you that we actually can learn many different kinds of models and that we have also to be very, very careful in robotics since not everything we do is actually that straightforward uh, regression problem, for example, as people thought initially. So let's look at types of models. And yes. So you cannot access any form of, well, you get probably a GPS-like position, position um, which they didn't have in the experiments which they published. I think on the rover itself, they probably have some, uh, something relative to the satellites, but I don't think it's very accurate. So most likely they have very, they know very, very little about the position. gives you very bad signal. So we used to do this for, uh, when we did robot locomotion and um, you get, I think we got about maximum uh, something like 19 seconds where we had a position, which was uh, not somewhere on moon. So the, the errors accumulate unfortunately in most cases, um, unless you have an additional observation, they accumulate very, very fast. So IMU only helps you when you have intermittently all this um, other kind of observations, if you want to integrate it up. What does help those that the IMU usually gives you a gravity vector um, due to the, since in the end is, today IMUs are implemented as a couple of springs, and that always gives you a gravity vector and that part is absolute. And that is actually a really helpful one. So now let's take you, let me take you onto the journey, unless there, is, are there more questions? Okay, let me take you onto the journey towards models. Now, classical robotics nearly always works on continuous time. For robot learning, we actually prefer discrete time for the simple reason that we like to implement things on a computer. There's a lot of theoretical advanta advantages of continuous time because you don't get any discretization artifacts but um, practically we lose them by the overhead of having to work in continuous time with a learning system and by having to deal with the, well, with the problem of integrating a system which again creates the new errors. Now, there are four types of use models which we have seen useful in robotics. The first one is pretty obvious. If you wanna do something, predict the future state. That's a very classical problem. I'm pretty sure that every one of you has tried at some point in their lives to predict the stock market. I mean, who hasn't, who, everybody who has done machine learning in, in his life has tried this at least once, tried to get a data set, figure out whether there isn't something inherent to, uh, to it and whether you couldn't predict the stock market. And nearly, I think every one of us has failed because we don't have a direct cable to the stock exchange where we could maybe predict the next couple of minutes quite successfully, but definitely not um, the long-term trend. So predicting such a future state, well, that is what we call learning a forward model. Now, we though have a system which we can change. And this gives us a slightly different problem too. It gives us the idea of learning an inverse model. An inverse model for the stock market applied is how much money would you have to, have to actually invest in order to change the stock market? And that's obviously for us a much, much more important quantity. So we would like to know, well, how much force do I have to push so that this monitor falls over? I won't do it, don't worry. Um, but that's obviously super important. And then it turns out that what you will see in a moment, that inverse models are not that trivial. But forward models nearly always are well, making us happy in one form or another. Inverse models don't always exist. And if they exist, sometimes you need to actually mix in forward models in order to get an inverse model. And then finally, 
there are things which well, we call these days multi-step models. In the old days, we also called them operator models. So basically, what will happen if I take a long sequence of things and throw them into a system? Well, what, how many steps can I actually predict the head along with it in one compound prediction? And um, well, these are the so-called multi-step models. Now, the first one is easy, right? In the end, predicting the next state, given the current state and action, plus some noise, well, obviously requires a data set consisting of state and action, and um, with the well, labels being the outputs. Prediction is, well, prediction is usually like learning a simulator, since we can use it for long-term prediction, but we can also already use it for action generation. Since if you have a desired next state, well, we could search for the one action which minimizes the distance and to this desired next state. But this would be obviously a costly process since we are searching in a well, relatively high dimensional space in real time. Now, the next kind of model are inverse models. And for inverse models, well, we, have a, uh, we are directly getting, trying to get to this result that given the current state, and a desired next state, we would like to know the corresponding, the useful action. And that obviously requires a slightly different problem. So it's been now taking this, the sequence which we have, so state and next state, taking these two inputs and trying to predict from that um, the action which will, would lead to exactly this transition. It's probably the one problem which has been around the longest in robot learning and is still every time there's a new machine learning method, people directly try to write a new paper about it and manage to do somewhat better than, well, with the previous supervised uh, learning method in at least one respect or the other. Importantly, this allows us to learn if you have such a model, like a model of joint positions, joint velocities, and, well, the joint accelerations, in this case, this is in continuous time form. Well, in this case, you could just enter a PD controller uh, for the desires, and you would be able to well, control your robot really, really efficiently. But the big question, of course, is do these inverse models always exist? No, no, not, not always. If they do, if your system is an invertible function, then yes. They do exist, but that's actually not the case. Since, well, look at basically my arm here. Now, if my controller is just to go with my hand along a trajectory, well, there is a ton of things I could do for the rest of the degrees of freedom. Now, this is called redundancy. And redundancy, of course, makes it that I have infinitely many solutions. So clearly, not every, in, not every, um, well, invert, not everything can be done by an inverse model. In one example where, well, we can, where we, well, one example which we had already was inverse kinematics. You saw this already with the redundancy. Inverse kinematics was actually a big thing in robot learning. Well, was a big thing in robot learning in the last time the neural networks were hip again. So in the second neural wave, you could say, um, where Michael Jordan actually wrote what some of his key papers which made him back then famous about it with the distal teacher. And similarly, well, we actually studied a lot of systems with hysteresis, like actual aerodynamics or friction usually has a hysteresis. In this case, well, in both of these cases, though, in order to get something right, you need to first use the last state and action pair to predict in what kind of regime you are in order to do subsequently choose an action to affect your future uh, regime. So if you have an hysteresis where in one direction or the other direction you would have, well, very different forces, well, predicting first along this path helps. Similarly, if you had a 
well, inverse kinematics problem. Well, knowing that you want to be close to a certain posture, this also obviously helps. So predicting, well, what happens next gives you this latent variable z, which then again allows you to choose an inverse model, which at least locally is right. And interestingly, locally we can always find some, not necessarily unique, but some inverse models which are actually useful. Now the next step, of course, is, well, what can we do if we had a sequence of actions and we wanted to, throw, wanted to know what they actually do? Well, that brings us to the mixed models, or multi-step, sorry, sorry multi-step models or operator models. And the Mars rover is basically one of the best examples, right? You actually want to learn a simulator of that system, which you cannot simulate or model yourself anymore, and in order to cope with the delays. And, well, multi-step is really, really useful for open-loop control, since if you would just take many single steps after each other and simulate them separately, well, the error, your error of your model would actually explode. And you can't actually tie it down that efficiently. Oops. Now this goes interesting. PowerPoint. Um, these slides used to be in Keynote before I started to teach a class together with a friend of mine. And since then they have interesting new animations which I did not put in. Um, the first, well, one thing which is well, in robotics always key is to decompose a problem in terms of two subproblems. One problem is to cope with the ge inverse geometry of the body. This we call inverse kinematics. Basically, the question is, well, where if I want to have my finger somewhere, like let's say here, what kind of joint angles do I need? The second big problem which we have in robotics is the one of, well, inverse dynamics. And that is, well, I'm living as a physical system. I, I need to, some, need to re create the right forces in order to really achieve the geometric behavior which I would like to have. In kinematics, kinematics we can actually solve by engineering, if you want to. Not, um, since basically we can always measure joint angles very well, well, but um, it's only the inverse kinematic step which is expensive. That's why it was such a big topic in the, 19, the late 1980s, early 1990s, when, for example, the distal teacher method by Jordan was proposed. Dynamics, on the other hand, remains an inherently important problem. Especially dynamics with contact. It's still something where, um, due to actuator dynamics, due to friction, due to soft bodies, something where large errors are normal. The dynamics models of industrial robots have a 50% error, just to give you a feel for that. Most of that is friction and actuator dynamics. But um, yeah, some of it probably is also problems with the CAT data. Um, let me, well, we could actually do this. Hmm. Now, right, let's skip these um, example problems. Oh. So learning, well, these are the classical equations, and you obviously um, recognize forward kinematics is always a function. Thus, um, since, well, yeah, joint angles have exactly one geometric interpretation. Similarly, if you take the derivatives, now have the Jacobian in there, this still remains a function if you have all of these variables. So importantly, well, you need both the Q and the Q dot in order to predict the X, the velocity at your finger. You need both joint velocity and joint position. And, um, well, it gets even more tedious when you want to predict the joint, the acceleration at your finger, but you need both the acceleration at your joints, the velocity at your joints, and the position at your joints. And well, for inverse kinematics, on the other hand, you recognize this is not always a function. On for dynamics, 
this is some, somewhat more what harder because in this case we are actually doing two steps. Most of the time when we're dealing with a system, well, we always pretend we get things on a nice, perfect sampling rate. There's actually uncertainty at when your signals are really from. So you get actually a little bit of stochasticity in your signals automatically um, when you're implementing things on a computer. And so we normally, well, try to learn for that reason discrete time models whereas that doesn't, is not, are not affected by the problems of integration but it really only works when we, pre, when we are trying to sample from the same time step. Let me skip this. Oops, no, I didn't. Okay. The first kind of model which we try to learn is, well, usually the inverse dynamics models, but sometimes you even want to learn in operational space control models which tell us how to move um, with a finger along a reference trajectory and give us the right forces for that. And again, you can maybe recognize which of these two do you think is solvable by just supervised learning off the shelf? And which is, uh, what about the other one? Okay, fine. Who of you thinks I can solve this by supervised learning? Okay, second election time. Um, who of you doesn't think we can solve this by supervised learning? <laughs> My God, if you, now I know why Trump made it into the White House. All of you guys didn't go for voting, huh? <laughs> or whatever, the current government of, I don't know, at least 15 countries at the moment where we are unhappy with as academics. Okay, well, shall we try it one more time? Making you guys sleepy, I have noticed that, so. Now we've made it special, so maybe repeat the question one more time, you will get both votes. Okay. okay, who thinks this year is a supervised learning problem? Okay, who thinks this isn't a supervised learning problem? So the first group was right. Um, this year is a supervised learning problem because um, we have uh, full, we have the full joint state at which we are trying to uh, predict, but we are predicting what we're using here, so we can actually learn an inverse model. So let's ask the second time. Who thinks this year is a supervised learning problem? Okay, who thinks it isn't? Okay, second group is right this time. There's only two people. So my God, I think even our politicians would be ashamed of that voter participation. So why is this? Well, here, we all notice we are dealing in task space. So we implicitly, in this dynamics model, still have a kinematics model. And this implicit kinematics model obviously, well, is not a regression problem at per se anymore. Okay, now, we of course want to do learning in real time and online. And even for that, there are slightly different architectures is in robot learning than you would normally see in, in robot model learning than you would normally see in supervised learning. The easiest, of course, is you just want to learn, now in this case, an inverse model of the robot body. Well, you would grab a signal at the entry of the robot, that given which is the, you would grab the action, and you would also grab at the encoder, you would grab, try to, uh, the encoders, you would try to grab the state, and you would try to learn a model. Now, this sounds like Trivial, right? This is what we do with this chuck exchange all the time. What about this one here? Now, this should make you feel funny. We are grabbing at a very funny location. We are using the model for control. So the feedback, if you have a perfect model, this feedback controller will stay completely silent. It will not learn. Uh, and it will not do anything because the model does everything in that case. But if this feedback controller turns on, then this means something is wrong with the model. And its command, like this could be a PD controller, for example, its command can directly be used to train our robot, can directly be used to train our robot model. And finally, we have something really funny, and this could be used for is the so-called distal teacher by Jordan, which you can use in order to train a mixed model. In a mixed model, you usually have the big problem of 
trying to figure out how to learn an inverse model. And you have an ill-posed inverse, inverse model learning problem. In this case, though, you can usually still learn a forward model, and you can use the output of the forward model to create a surrogate error for your inverse model, um, or to create, fill in information for your inverse model. And, uh, well, that's very, very helpful for many things. Generically, robot learning, obviously, model learning, has a lot of problems when it comes to high dimensionality, smoothness, discontinuities, noise, missing data. Our data sets are at the same time too large and too small. So on the one hand, we have a continuously growing data set which um, grows at the rate of between 500 and 8 kilohertz. So they grow really, really fast. On the other hand, all this data is highly correlated. So you need to actually, well, subsample to get meaningful data out of it if you want to use it for supervised learning. And, well, when you look at a task, like if you look at this ball in a cup task, well, there's only one data point which actually matters. That's the whole trajectory together. That's the reason why we usually have, well, also two small data sets, because they're also episodic. And then we want to have online updates for model learning. And, well, in some cases, we can incorporate prior knowledge like physics. That's obviously super helpful. And then there comes an issue we normally never have in machine learning. We actually need to worry about the safety of our robot and the safety of all humans involved, which, um, well, is also kind of non-trivial. So let's, let me take you to uh, two examples. The first example is the one of where we want to learn inverse dynamics. And for, well, inverse dynamics, you could now take the best possible model by the manufacturer, which um, is based on CAT data and well, some experimental values. And you see basically here a desired trajectory, which is the green one, which is from a human data set, human drawing data set. And you see the one which the robot achieves in red. And you notice that, well, if you just train offline on, on a static data set, you can do somewhat better than um, by supervised learning than you would actually be doing in if you were um, just use, blindly using the physics model. If you additionally allow the system to train online in real time, you can actually get a near perfect control performance. Now this is a non-trivial function approximation problem. Just look at it quickly for a robot arm. This means you're mapping 21 dimensions to seven dimensions. So that's, well, pretty high dimensional given that you want to be really good at them. Or even worse, if you look at a humanoid, you're mapping 90 dimensions to 30 dimensions, and that is for a humanoid with just 30 degrees of freedom. And then you want to learn in real time, so online adaptation is crucial, and you have an unlimited stream of data. Most of our work, I mean, up to recently, I would have said there's never that you're going to be able to do GPs or, or uh, sorry, still saying this about GPs in a classical sense, but there will never be neural networks effective there. Now, a student, my PhD student, Michael Luther, just proved me wrong on that. By now, you can actually make it even in real time with the neural net quite well working. But um, in terms of real robot results, up to recently, they were really just the LWPR approaches by Stefan Schall, and as well as the well, local Gaussian process approximations which we did on this. So how would this work? Well, we would try if we wanted to make a GP work in online learning. Well, obviously we can't use the N cube um, uh, computation power of computing the inverse. Instead, we would need some form of activation function which allows us to take, um, well, a subset of the data points and um, with these subsets create, with the subsets create um, a GP model. And let me show you how this looks like. Full for a data set where you can do this offline, you directly, of course, you can use more data points, which makes the local GP slightly better than the GP, the, by, sorry, the, you can, you, you can, Offline, you see the comparison between offline trained LGP 
and the Gaussian process regression, and you see then the online version, where the online version obviously can do much better. And now let me show you this should play automatically. Again, a new bug in the slides. And let's directly skip. No, actually. So the first one is with the classical physics model, and you already noticed there's a little bit off to it. And even worse, if you now start to destroy it, it, um, well, it will not be able to recover from it. Subsequently, well, you know, you need to notice one thing. This is very different from the industrial robots people use, because we've made this robot totally squishy. This is a necessity for say, if you want to have safe robots around humans. Classical industrial robots would be like this table. I could not push against them. But they also would be, have a totally stiff feedback controller control thing in them. But with the, well, we make them so soft like humans that they can always push you aside since you don't want to invest a lot of energy into it. Now this here is with online learning and uh, a learned GP model where all of the inaccuracies are, well, um, basically well, learned away, and you can very heavily perturb the robot, but nevertheless um, still get good behavior. So now let me take you to the second um, case study, and I really shouldn't have eliminated the third. I don't know when I did this. Um, I want to now learn how to move directly in finger space, and that's obviously a super important problem. Thank you, PowerPoint. In this super important problem, you can see here two instances of it. The first instance is the one of, um, well, a robot having only an IMU vector standing on a pretty rough surface. In this case, the center of, the, we want to control the center of gravity you know, this, uh, of the robot so that it's always above its foot polygon. Now, that's a nice learning problem for, an, well, for, it's a nice problem for operational space control. But you want to well, modify the reference, you want to follow a reference acceleration. In the upper problem, you see, um, in this case, a robot arm, and it has a glass of water on the end effector. And it should follow a, fi a figure eight without losing the glass. So kind of unlike me. And it turns out that getting these is to work with classical methods is really, really hard. But of course, we would like to use learning for that. And well, learning requires learn, of course, now solving a non-regression problem in this case by dealing with it like a regression problem. Since we basically would have the forward mapping is totally unique, right? Both this point and this point would give you a physically sensible prediction, but going the opposite direction would actually give you physical nonsense somewhere, it could give you physical nonsense somewhere in the middle. And um, well, there's two different, uh, there's different ways of how you could deal with this. One is to only focus on one of the modes, in, well, training your system to, um, to have a preference, or you could regularize your system so that it always would remain physically plausible. And there, our knowledge of physics helps us. Because our knowledge of physics actually tells us that all physics relies on the fact that our torques are minimized in a squared sense. But the metric in physics is usually the inertia metric. And this is even instantaneous reward, so it's not even a, a long-term reward. So you can use it directly as a regularizer in a supervised learning problem. You don't even have to make it, uh, you don't have to make it a long-term reward as a reinforcement learning. So once you take this assumption and you pull it into the, well, into your system in order to get the regression task, well, your model learning, your inverse model learning becomes basically a weighted regression problem where weighting where the weighting becomes, well, smaller for data, which goes away further from physics, and only a mode remains in the end. So 
So here, importantly, it's a kind of an exponential transformation of this, or it's, a re, it's an exponential transformation of this reward with some temperature in there. And subsequently, while well, you're being pushed into the banana, and most of the time, you actually create a preference for one of the melts. We use this within locally weighted linear regression. So um, where the weights get in here into the regression problem. I saw there was regression on the slide before, so this morning. So I'm not going to review for you the weighted regression unless you want to. No? Perfect. Um, so we take basically, well, we, we do a weighted locally linear regression in this case and use as the weights, now these physics-based weights, it's in this case just the square torque. And what happens? Well, we actually can get a control law which follows nearly perfectly in simulation as well as on the real robot. And well, let me show you how this looks on the real robot for um, this particular robot. In this case, this is a kind of an imaginary trajectory here, which it is following with these um, with the red dots. Here it's following the being the red dot on a or the red ball on a stick. Um, as uh, well as an inverse kinematics task, uh, inverse, uh, as an operational space control learned task. So, key conclusion for us in robotics, though, uh, robot learning is: when you can learn a model, learn the model. And sometimes learning an inverse model, I mean, learning an inverse model especially is a useful thing. But sometimes it really requires averaging over multiple non-convex solutions. Inverse models are super useful if you can have them. In fact, they're more useful than forward models because they're not so prone to the optimization bias. But learning good models generically is well also super hard. So now I'm actually done for what I wanted to do today, and we have only seven minutes left, right? So I best stop here and um, you guys get your coffee break and you guys start with a hands-on tutorial after that right after yes so okay and then tomorrow we do reinforcement learning